Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to have the chance to introduce uh, Dr. Shumit Ganguly. Um, Shumit is, is known to many of you. He spent some time here at Austin, but he's had really quite a remarkable uh, 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 in a number of different uh, incarnations uh, over the last several years. Uh, as you probably know, he's now, uh, I, I'm going to try to pronounce uh, the name of his chair, yeah, even though I, I, I uh, should be able to do so. But he is uh, a chairholder in Indian Cultures and Civilizations at Indiana University now, um, and, uh, but had previously been here at UT, as you know, and at James Madison College of Michigan State University, at Hunter College of uh, City University, and um, he taught at uh, SIPA at Columbia. Um, uh, were you a visiting <coughs> professor there? Um, I was an adjunct. Adjunct teacher. professor there, which is uh, a school that many of us know well and uh, quite a distinguished one. He's had uh, a remarkable uh, career in publishing, uh, both uh, in very uh, well-respected uh, uh, academic journals as well as in uh, more uh, uh, contemporary public policy journals, and uh, obviously something of great interest to all of us here. Um, He's edited a number of books. Uh, he's written uh, uh, very important uh, studies on uh, the relationship between India and Pakistan, uh, which is uh, enormously influential, I think, for many policymakers who've been uh, dealing with that issue. Uh, and uh, uh, most importantly, among these things, to my mind, is a, is a good friend and, and colleague of my good friend and colleague, uh, Steve Cohen at uh, Brookings, who is, I think, sort of, we would all see as sort of the dean of the. Uh, the, the policy scholars in, uh, in South Asia studies. And uh, uh, Steve uh, tells me uh, how fortunate we are to be able to have uh, Schumer come and visit with us and looking forward to his uh, talk on uh, what's going on in India and the implications for uh, U.S. Uh, policy going forward. Schumer? Thank you very much, Jim. <clears throat> um, it's a bit of a ritualistic incantation to say how much one enjoys visiting a particular place. But in this case, it's not a ritualistic incantation. It's something quite heartfelt. I spent three and a half wonderful years of my life here in Austin and uh, have very, very fond memories of this place. So it is indeed a delight to escape the cold of Indiana, if albeit briefly. Um, um, uh, uh, Jim just gave me my marching orders in terms of time. And so I'm going to plunge fairly directly into my uh, topic without uh, much preliminary um, uh, talk. Um, what I intend to do is, to, uh, the title of my talk is entitled A Requiem for Non-Alignment. Uh, what I intend to do in this talk is to talk about the transformation of Indian foreign policy, particularly at the end of the Cold War. And the talk is divided into six di distinct segments. Very briefly, I will talk about the origins of non-alignment, and very briefly at that, in a very compressed fashion. Um, uh, I'll be happy to elaborate on that uh, in, during the Q&A. Second, I will talk about the Cold War's end and the consequences of a structural shift in global politics. What were the consequences for India and for Indian foreign policy? Third, I will talk about the options that Indian policymakers felt that they had available to them uh, in the wake of the Soviet collapse and the end of the Cold War and the structural shift in global politics. Fourth, I will talk about the consequences uh, and the choices that they made given the options uh, that they had. Uh, fifth, uh, I will briefly talk about where uh, uh, Indian foreign policy is headed and what are sort of the forces driving Indian foreign policy today. And sixth and finally, I will tease out uh, the implications for U.S.-Indian relations. What does it mean in terms of American foreign policy? Why should we care one way or other where Indian foreign policy is headed? Uh, surely it must be of some significance to us. Otherwise, why would you want to even listen to this talk uh, to begin with? Um, let me proceed uh, fairly directly. Um, the origins of non-alignment are fairly straightforward. They really stem from the sort of the disproportionate role that two individuals played in the Indian nationalist movement. One was Mohandas Gandhi, popularly referred to as Mahatma Gandhi, and the other was Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister. Nehru was clearly sort of primus inter Paris amongst his colleagues because very few of his colleagues had had much international experience, whereas Nehru had been involved in international affairs as early as 1923 at a major conference in Brussels against uh, imperialism and colonial oppression, uh, where he had uh, sort of cut his teeth and had become very interested in global affairs and had written 
written quite extensively. It's a little known fact that Nehru sitting in a British prison in India actually had predicted that ne Neville Chamberlain would lack the moral fiber to stand up to Hitler. Uh, that he would a end up appeasing Hitler. And Nehru had such a profound understanding of British society and politics that he was able to do that. Um, Nehru and Gandhi, in many ways, laid the foundations of post-independence India's foreign policy. And they had visions of creating a normative world order, a world order where, uh, which enshrined anti-colonialism, which relied on multilateral institutions, which sought to hobble the use of force in international politics, essentially a kind of a will, almost a Wilsonian vision of world order. Um, and that's where non-alignment stems from. Uh, and in part, non-alignment uh, stemmed not only from this desire to create, to reshape uh, the global order after uh, World War II and to promote anti-colonialism, but also Nehru was acutely concerned about the f possibilities of Bonapartism at home and about the opportunity and the opportunity costs of defense spending. Um, uh, and he feared that if India aligned itself with either of the two emergent blocs, there was a real danger of the military coming to the for and thereby raising the specter of Bonapartism, and also by aligning itself with one of the two blocs, India per force would have to spend much more on defense, and, uh, uh, and thereby uh, entailing significant opportunity costs uh, in other areas. Um, the irony is that under Nehru, for the most part, non-alignment was a very serious, profound commitment to transforming the world order even though ultimately it did not uh, succeed. Um, uh, under his successors, and most importantly under his daughter, Indira Gandhi, it really took on mostly rhetorical significance and had far less substance than it had under Nehru. And in fact, the hypocrisy of non-alignment became sort of really writ large when uh, in uh, the late 1970s, uh, Cuba, uh, became the head of the non-aligned movement. Uh, it, and at that point, uh, leading Jun Junius Jaiwardena, an otherwise unexceptional uh, uh, president of Sri Lanka, to remark that the only two countries that can truly consider themselves to be non-aligned are the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, that kind of drives the point home about the hypocrisy of non-alignment under Indira Gandhi by the late 1970s. But I'll be happy to elaborate on this point in greater detail during the Q&A. That's not the real crux of my talk. I just wanted to sp spell that out by way of background. Let me turn really to the second theme, which is really starts getting into the heart of my talk. It was really at the Cold War's end and faced with the Soviet collapse that India was forced to undergo a kind of an agonizing reappraisal of the fundamental shibboleths, of the fundamental beliefs, of the fundamental principles that had uh, guided its uh, uh, foreign policy, albeit often there was a discrepancy between rhetoric and actual behavior. Um, what did the Soviet collapse do, and what did the end of the Cold War bring to India in particular? There was a debate, as you well know, in this country about how America needs to, needed to reconfigure its grand strategy at the end of the Cold War. In a markedly similar fashion, Indian foreign policymakers were faced with the same kind of conundrum of now that we can no longer rely on certain constants in Indian foreign policy, things which we had come to uh, accept uh, as sort of um, things that would continue indefinitely, matters which would not fundamentally change. The Soviet Union would continue to drift along, perhaps stagnating in terms of economic growth, but nevertheless not fundamentally altering its policies and being a fairly reliable partner of India, especially since 1971, um, when India had signed a treaty of peace, friendship, and cooperation, a 20-year treaty uh, in 71. And so there were certain things that Indian foreign policymakers had come to see as constants, the things that they could rely upon, the things that were not subject to dramatic change in the structure of global politics. All these assumptions were fundamentally called into question with the end of the Cold War and the Soviet collapse. But more specifically, what happened? Three things. One, it meant an end to the end of Soviet weaponry uh, at bargain basement prices, uh, including weaponry which the Soviets were not prepared to sell to their fraternal allies in Eastern Europe. 
um, uh, support for India in the United Nations Security Council against a possible adverse resolution on the Kashmir issue, India sort of actually is heel, and also a strategic hedge against possible Chinese revanchism. Suppose you get again, you know, a border conflict with China, a major dispute with China. After all, India had uh, fought a major border war, which it had lost in 1962. So there was a real sense of a bet noir about China, um, a real uh, sense of insecurity when it came to China. And the Soviets could always be relied on to tie the Chinese down. And in fact, they had done that quite effectively in the 1971 war uh, with Pakistan when China threatened to open another front um, um, along the uh, Himalayan uh, border. Um, so all of this virtually overnight draws to a close. The Soviets say, we will no longer sell you weapons on a rupee-ruble basis. Uh, we now insist on hard currency. Um, uh, you cannot count on us, Gorbachev says, in the, uh, uh, in the event of a conflict with China. And obviously, this anemic successor to the Soviet Union, the principal successor, Russia, could not be counted upon to use its veto um, to support in the, India at the United Nations Security Council. So something that the Indians had completely relied upon, a, se a set of uh, uh, of issues that the Indians had totally relied upon overnight, essentially the rug was sort of pulled out from underneath their feet. Also with the Cold War's end came to, uh, uh, there was a fundamental challenge to this state-led model of economic growth. India was a professedly socialist country, but for all practical purposes, it was not. It did have a behemoth public sector, which actually contributed a new word to economic science. It's called dissaving. It's actually another word for loss. Um, about 1990, uh, it was losing about 2.5% of GDP annually. Um, and uh, uh, and there was a, uh, India reached a point uh, by even by 1990, of course, there was a fiscal crisis. But even by 1980, um, uh, there were questions being raised about this state-led model of economic growth. And with the Soviet collapse, that model really came under systematic attack. And consequently, India had to, Indian policymakers had to seriously rethink this strategy of economic growth, which had produced, in the, in the words of an eminent Indian economist, Raj Krishna, he had referred to it as the Hindu rate of growth, making a pun on the economist term, a secular, the secular rate of growth. And the Hindu rate of growth sort of hovered around 3, 3.5% three annually, sometimes about 4, but you always had to deduct about 2 percentage points for population growth, giving you an effective growth rate of about 2, and a, two to 2.5%. Two All the while talking about how you're making a structural dent on poverty. In 1991, India's poverty rates by its own statistics was close to 40% of the population. If this is success, one should embrace failure any day. Um, it is about 26% now um, uh, by its official statistics and also confirmed by the World Bank. Um, and uh, this is, in my judgment, uh, in large part because of the embrace of the market since 1991. But this is something we can talk about at greater length during the Q&A. Again, the larger point to emphasize is that the collapse of the Soviet Union challenged this model of state-led economic growth and forced India to start thinking about embracing more market-friendly and market-oriented policies of economic growth. And even with fitful efforts towards that end in the, in, uh, <clears throat> from the 1980s, one started to see uh, Indian economic growth shoot up to about 5% to 5.5%, and then by the 1990s as high as 7 and in the last quarter, 8.9% um, uh, uh, is the latest uh, figure. And now Indian economists are gingerly talking about uh, aiming at double-digit economic growth. Uh, but more on that subject later. Finally, India's policymakers also started to question the utility of this whole model of third world solidarity, which it had promoted as early as uh, uh, the 1970s, particularly in the wake of the first oil crisis and with the formation of the Group of 77 in the United Nations. 
they began to have doubts about this because they realized that when uh, times really got tough, India had very few friends in this world. For all this notion of third world solidarity, uh, in times of real economic or military distress, very few of India's third world uh, uh, compatriots ever came to India's rescue. It took a long time for seemingly knowledge impervious policymakers to come to this conclusion, but by about the early 1990s, it, this had finally penetrated their consciousness that third world solidarity really did not in any material fashion benefit India. Um, it was a wonderful slogan, but that's all it was. It was rhetoric and sloganeering and really didn't produce any tangible material benefits. What were the options then? Uh, to turn to my third point uh, that were open before Indian, po Indian policymakers in, at the end of the Cold War faced with the Soviet collapse and the emergence of even if fleeting uh, American unipolarity. Three possible uh, uh, choices uh, that uh, the policymakers examined <coughs> uh, and this, these were the subjects of public debate in India. Number one, Believe it or not, there were people who still felt that non-alignment remained extraordinarily relevant. It remained relevant because non-alignment could be reconfigured now. Non-alignment meant simply having autonomy in one's decision making. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with the superpowers. That was something that, that was a meaning that other people had assigned to it. It really meant strategic autonomy. And India should pursue strategic autonomy and call it non-alignment. And India should still emphasize third world solidarity, given that there was still a significant north-south divide. This was one particular camp uh, in the Indian foreign policy establishment, one that is increasingly marginal today. Second, um, a variant of this camp, which saw the writing on the wall, but still wasn't quite willing to him to sort of uh, read the writing on the wall and come to terms with the writing on the wall, uh, argued that India should pursue uh, a strategy designed to forge a multipolar world. And how might one do that? Well, one would sort of work with Russia, China, uh, and France and oppose what the French called Im uh, American hyper puissance, uh, hyperpower. Uh, uh, and there were a number of uh, takers uh, for this particular position and with some encouragement uh, from uh, Beijing and some uh, encouragement um, uh, from Paris. Uh, this notion started to acquire a degree of currency uh, in the corridors of power in New Delhi. But the third option really was the one that was ultimately chosen, which meant a grudging acceptance of American dominance of global dominance and American global power, uh, even, and even a willingness to partially align with the United States. Um, this was the third option that was finally chosen after considerable debate. But how was this option chosen? In large part, it was because of the unprecedented fiscal crisis of 1991, when India had bought oil on the spot market prior to the, uh, the first Gulf War and thereby depleted much of its foreign exchange reserves. It had to repatriate about 130,000 workers from the Middle East and thereby lost well over uh, 10 to $15 billion worth of remittances within the span of a year. And in addition to that, had to pay for the cost of um, uh, repatriating these workers uh, from the Middle East um, uh, who were affected uh, rather adversely uh, by the Gulf War. In effect, India's GDP shrank by 1% in one year. It was faced with an unprecedented fiscal crisis because simultaneously a series of loans to multilateral banks came due, or the loan payments came due. Matters had reached such a pass that India <clears throat> had six weeks worth of foreign exchange cover to buy edible oils. Uh, on which it relies on global markets uh, uh, because it does not produce adequate ed n amounts of edible oil uh, uh, at home. And this is something that affects even the poorest of the poor in India. And things got even worse when India had to mortgage gold from its treasury to uh, Swiss uh, banks uh, to get foreign exchange. 
Of course, there were people in India who said, well, all we need to do is to tide over this balance of payments crisis, uh, go to the IMF, get another loan, uh, and uh, simply sort of go back to the things we were doing, but do them more efficiently, and we'll be fine. Fortunately, there was a finance minister who was an Oxford-trained economist, the current prime minister of India, Manmohan Singh, and a very astute prime minister, Narasimha Rao, who said no. This is the model we have pursued since independence. This is the model that has been the road to perdition for us. Um, it is time that we adopt a new set of economic policies and simultaneously shift the entire course of Indian foreign policy. We were the ones who lost out in the Cold War. The writing is on the wall. All we will be doing is staving off the inevitable. If we go to the IMF, get um, um, some money to tide over our immediate difficulties, and we continue with this behemoth state, state sector at home, our uh, reflexive anti-Americanism abroad, um, our unwillingness to integrate ourselves into, into the global marketplace. Um, and Manmohan Singh, in a very astute speech, said, what is it that South Korea has that we do not possess? given that South Korea in 1947 had a per capita income lower than that of India. He, and then he answered his own question. He said they have pursued market-friendly policies, and we have not. And we have instead treated the states of the, uh, the high, uh, the states in Southeast Asia and East Asia that have grown at this dramatic pace as sort of squalid puppets of American imperialism. He didn't quite use that language, but that was implicitly what he was saying. Instead, what have they accomplished? They have not only accomplished high growth rates, they have significantly reduced poverty. We have neither generated high growth rates, nor have we resolved the problem of endemic poverty. We need to reorient our foreign uh, dip our, our, our diplomacy and also our foreign economic policy. And thereby begins this saga of a complete sh shift. There was also a recognition that simply uh, making faces at the Americans was not going to get you very far. Uh, and in any case, there was no one else to turn to. Unlike in the Cold War era, when you could always turn to the Soviet Union for weaponry, for cheap oil, uh, uh, for assistance with steel plants, all that was over and also access, by the way, to Eastern European markets, because the Eastern Europeans didn't want your shoddy refrigerators, uh, which the, you sold to the Soviets, and the Soviets then marked up and sold to the Eastern Europeans. Uh, all that was gone. There was a structural shift in global politics and economic power, and you had to come to terms with that. And fortunately, this is where contingency plays a very important role, that you had two individuals who correctly understood the emerging global order and the necessity for making fundamental changes. Which brings me to my fourth point of choices and consequences. This meant an end to what was called the license permit quota Raj, once again quoting the eminent Indian economist Raj Krishna, who gave us the term the Hindu rate of growth. It also meant an end to the, the uh, an, uh, concomitant end to the Hindu rate of growth within a couple of years of the adoption of market-friendly policies, India was growing at well over 6% annually and making a dent, finally, in rural and urban poverty. It also meant uh, full diplomatic relations with Israel, which India had kept at an arm's length. Um, and the relationship with Israel was seen as vital to improving relations with the United States. India also played a vital role in 1992 of also uh, overturning the rather loathsome uh, and the loathsome is my word. Um, uh, it's a loaded term, but I use it advisedly. Um, uh, UN resolution equating Zionism with racism. That was overturned. And India also uh, embarked on what was called the Look East policy to start engaging the states of Southeast Asia, which had lots of surplus capital, and also started to look at their markets, not only to attract investment from them, but also to actively seek markets for Indian products in Southeast Asia. Third, it also sought to build a robust relationship with the United States, something which it had kept at arm's length for the most part since about 1966. 
um, after a breach with the Johnson administration, which we can talk about again during the Q&A. Um, and uh, despite continuing differences on the vexed question of the disputed state of Kashmir and obviously non-proliferation. And finally, <clears throat> contrary to popular belief, it was not the BJP that made the critical decision to move ahead with the pursuit of nuclear weapons. These decisions really had been made for well over 20 years, continued by the Narasimha Rao regime, and ultimately the BJP reaped uh, the benefits of all benefits, if you happen to share that view, um, of testing nuclear weapons in 1998. It is well known now that in 1995, were it not for the intervention of Ambassador Frank Wisner, who was the ambassador to New Delhi, India might have tested in December 1995. So a decision was also made to actively pursue the nuclear weapons program and to push it um, uh, forward. Um, the, and not uh, e all the while still maintaining the rhetoric about the importance of global uh, disarmament. That was obviously one of the leftovers from the non-aligned era, the, the rhetoric thereof. <laughs> Fifth, um, where is Indian foreign policy headed? given all these changes that have taken place. Not just foreign, foreign policy, but foreign economic policy headed. Um, uh, uh, I think there are four items that I would like to highlight. One is ha India has, for good or uh, ill, a culture, a political culture of fierce independence. This means that India will not align itself wholeheartedly with any country. Relations with the United States will improve and improve dramatically in the years ahead, but there will be issues where the Indians will still remain prickly, difficult, independent, in a manner not terribly dis uh, dissimilar uh, from France. Um, uh, they will maintain a certain kind of distance. On certain issues, they will support us wholeheartedly. On others, there is going to be this kind of um, a prickliness and unwillingness um, uh, to go along uh, with American uh, concerns and imperatives. Second, um, there is a clear-cut understanding in the corridors of power in New Delhi, uh, that there is a structural need to engage the global economy to sustain economic growth, uh, domestic economic growth. There is no returning to the policies of the past. Um, yes, there are certain pockets of resistance. The left in India looks askance at increasing economic liberalization of the opening up of the Indian economy. So this is going to proceed in fits and starts. It's not going to happen in a linear, continuous fashion. There will be uh, periods which will go fallow when very little, uh, 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 by way of uh, the em continuing embrace of the market, will take place. But I don't think the overall direction of the embrace of, uh, uh, of economic liberalization is going to change fundamentally in the foreseeable future. Uh, <clears throat> and this is related, really, into an emerging epistemic consensus on economic policy making, on what generates economic growth, what enable <clears throat> enables you to alleviate poverty. Um, there is a new consensus that's emerging, and the consensus is against a behemoth role for the state, except not sort of jettisoning the baby with the bathwater. The state will still maintain uh, you know, certain kinds of regulatory functions, certain kinds of adjudicatory functions. It's not, it's not a state that will completely wither away, not in the way Marx had visualized, but perhaps more Adam Smith. Um, there, there will still be the visible hand of the state in certain areas. Um, it just means that the state will not be hostile towards uh, the market. Dramatic changes will come about uh, in Indian foreign policy and foreign economic policy, but only when they are driven by crises. 
And uh, a student and I are actually writing an article about this, about fundamental shifts in Indian foreign policy making. Um, uh, when there were dramatic shifts that occurred, all of them were the results of either exogenously generated or endogenously generated crises. India seems to have a tradition of incrementalism, uh, of making decisions in a piecemeal fashion, except when a fundamental crisis forces uh, the hands of policymakers as, the, as, as it did in 1991. What are the implications of all of this for Indo-US relations? I'll spell out uh, two in particular. One, for once now, in the last decade or so, the relationship has some real ballast, unlike during the Cold War. Today, um, uh, American FDI, foreign direct investment, though not substantial by the standards of investment in China or other play or Western Europe for that matter, uh, while not substantial in aggregate terms, is in critical sectors of the Indian economy, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, informatics, high-end manufacturing. This is where American investment is playing a very important role. So there is some economic ballast to the relationship. Two, diplomatic. India has cooperated with the United States quite effectively in the wake of the Christmas, Christmas tsunami, uh, the, in the Christmas tsunami relief operations, stretching all the way from the littoral states of India, from Sri Lanka, all the way to Indonesia. Um, it has cooperated with the uh, United States on the issue of Iran and, on, and, sa and uh, uh, sanctions against its, uh, not sanctions, but the, the reporting Iran to the IAEA for its uh, violation of uh, NPT norms. Uh, India is likely to participate in the United States, with the United States uh, under the aegis of the UN in future peacekeeping operations. India has a long and honorable record of uh, peacekeeping, and uh, with the way the world is headed, peacekeeping operations will remain with us for the foreseeable future. In the military realm also, there is considerable uh, significance. India is poised to make significant weapons purchases uh, from, the, uh, from the United States, particularly a new generation of fighter aircraft, uh, though there are other competitors. Uh, there is something called the NSSP, which has mostly come to a close, the next steps in the strategic partnership involving a quartet, quartet of issues, uh, uh, civilian space cooperation, nuclear, civilian nuclear cooperation, and the particular bill right now is in conference committee, uh, high, dual use high technology and missile defense. So in all of these various areas, for the first time, in almost 60 years of India's independence, is there an integral relationship with the United States, a relationship that would be difficult to unravel easily, uh, something that had not been characteristic of the past. Um, the problem, of course, while these are all forces that are driving the relationship forward and in a direction that I applaud, there is an issue that we have to forthrightly confront. And here I will turn the scholarship of a eminent international relations scholar, Robert Axelrod, his formulation on its head, where Axelrod talks about a shadow of the future, why states might be more inclined to cooperate with each other because of the possibility of meeting up again. And if you defect, uh, then other people also have the possibility of defecting and um, thereby sort of leaving you high and dry. So uh, in r repeated iterations, you might, w you know, uh, might want to demonstrate a willingness to cooperate and thereby build up reputation and trust. In Indo-US relations, we are faced with the opposite. We have a shadow of the past. It's the shadow of the past, the palimpsest of the past, that lurks both in New Delhi and in Washington, D.C. In bureau important bureaucracies, both in Washington and in New Delhi, people have selective and particular memories of what the Indians did or did not do, acts of sin, acts of commission or omission, and by the same token in New Delhi. And no side is entirely free, free of blame. And consequently, there's a degree of circumspection, a degree of caution, and a degree of hesitation about expanding the scope and the depth of engagement for fear that the other side could prove to be unreliable. Uh, and, of course, both sides suffer from the problem of selective amnesia. So on this cautionary note, I will end this, uh, bring this talk to a close. I think I've still managed, amazingly enough, to keep within the half an hour.
Thank you, Shuman. That was great. And uh, I will abuse the privilege of the chair to ask the first question. Um, you've talked about um, some things that India and the United States are doing together, but I mean, they're largely instrumental. I mean, that is, you know, the Indians would like American military technology because we have the best, and that's understandable. They want access to markets and they want investment. But, but that doesn't really speak to any kind of strategic convergence at all in terms of. And so, my question to you is is there a strategic convergence or a possibility of strategic convergence? And in particular, it would strike me that there may be two possible areas, which is um, sort of the Bush administration's conception of the global war on terrorism and India's own dealing with Islamic extremism, and second, uh, on the democracy promotion front. And how much would these provide a basis for more than kind of instrumental and tactical cooperation? And, and how does India's, if it has one, its own strategic concept sort of potentially either converge or diverge from the United States? The amazing thing is those were my next points, uh, in case I needed more ammunition. Um, uh, and I'm not being jocular. They were really over here. Uh, 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 um, there is indeed cooperation um, on, uh, on counterterrorism, and that's one of the real areas of convergence. The area which remains an irritant uh, in, the, in that particular policy arena is Pakistan. Uh, where the, there's a perception in New Delhi that the U.S. is be giving General Musharraf far too much leeway, and General Musharraf is not being nearly as cooperative as he might be, particularly in trying to eviscerate the Taliban, remnants of the Taliban and preventing a recrudescence of the Al Qaeda. Um, there is an, there's a difference of opinion uh, amongst uh, policy experts who deal with uh, 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 counterterrorism issues. Uh, and this became very evident when I had, um, in a, at a conference at Indiana University last year, uh, the former head of the CIA South Asia section and her counterpart from New Delhi. Uh, and freed from the constraints of office, uh, they were able to talk about this a little more candidly. And this became one of the sticking points. Um, uh, I think there is cooperation in other areas which does not quite uh, come uh, to the radar screen. For example, stabilizing Afghanistan. There is a compelling common interest in ensuring that the Karzai regime can extend its writ slightly beyond the borders of Kabul uh, and can disarm the warlords, or if not disarm them, at least contain them in some fashion. Uh, Afghanistan is of vital importance to India. Um, because of the physical proximity, because of the fear of the return of the Taliban or some neo-Taliban elements supported by Pakistan. And it's, uh, it's in America, America's interest to ensure that um, you know, uh, Afghanistan does not go south. Um, on Iran, I think it's much more than instrumental. I think there's a real fear. Even though the Indians don't want to necessarily uh, peak the Iranians uh, because there's a substantial Shia community within India, and also want to use the Iranians as a possible counterweight against Pakistan, um, I don't think there's any love lost for I Iran's quest for nuclear weapons. Uh, in India would see that as an inimical development. Um, uh, it can't publicly announce these things, but this is an area of strategic convergence. The other thing I should emphasize, which I mentioned sort of en passant, is uh, um, uh, counterterrorism cooperation has taken on much more tangible uh, um, uh, components in that uh, Indian vessels after 9-11 escorted uh, American vessels, Indian naval vessels in the Straits of Malacca. Um, uh, 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 because India felt that this was something you know, vitally important, and this was a place where it could cooperate with the United States. The tsunami relief operations were absolutely extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, in terms of providing humanitarian assistance, that ad hoc coalition that was put together with Australia, uh, Japan, India, and the United States. Um, it was a remarkable uh, operation, and largely that had emerged as a consequence of the habits of mind and the interoperability that people had developed through a series of naval exercises. Um, India shares a common interest with the United States in terms of ensuring an uninterrupted supply of oil from the Persian Gulf. And India lacks the requisite naval capabilities to be of use at the moment to the United States, but one can see on the horizon if certain investments come to fruition, you could see much greater levels of cooperation there. 
So it's not purely attracting investment, uh, though I think that's a very important component or buying high technology, uh, weaponry, those are important components. I think there is a, um, a fundamental shift, and I think the shift would be much more profound were it not for this nagging issue of Pakistan. If somehow that could be uh, encapsulated somehow and set aside. And Frank Wisner, um, who was the ambassador to India um, about two ambassadors ago, um, started this process by what he called dehyphenation, a term I'm sure you're familiar with from your time in office, where he said, look, we're not going to talk about India and Pakistan in the same breath anymore. And Clinton, to his credit, actually started to put that into effect in 1999, and which generated a surge of goodwill um, in 1999. And that goodwill remains. Uh, the, the nettlesome issue always seems to be Pakistan. If there was some way, uh, you know, if someone could come up with a panacea to this, they should win the next Nobel Prize for peace. Um, uh, okay. So just on this issue of Pakistan, I've, you know, just hearing from the news, there seems to be a lot of effort on part of India to build good relations with Pakistan. It doesn't seem to suggest that pa it's looking at Pakistan anymore as an irritant. Uh, could you speak to that change? Uh, it, the present prime minister has practically staked his reputation against the advice of his national security advisor against the advice of many in the intelligence community in India to try and improve relations with Pakistan. It's almost as if he swallowed Robert Axelrod. Um, you know, we will continue to cooperate until such time you make a cooperative gesture. Um, uh, um, and probably has taken Axelrod too far. Um, but um, uh, the uh, 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 Perforce, it has to see Pakistan as an irritant. Because when bombs go off in downtown Srinagar, even in the height of winter when the Himalayan passes close, these bombs are not descending like manna from heaven. There is someone supplying them, these IEDs. Uh, these are not domestically manufactured. Uh, the Kashmir problem was of India's making. There's no question about it. I've written about this at length. But the subsequent uh, extension of the Kashmir problem, the continuing peaking of the Kashmir problem. Uh, for Pakistan, this is something that Pakistani decision makers feel compelled to do because they fear that India's size, its increasing, excuse me, global significance um, uh, and the like, and its uh, steady rate of economic growth, India can afford uh, to wait Pakistan out. And so the only way of reminding India that Kashmir is an issue, is to support these insurgent groups. So uh, it's a, the prime minister is making a valiant attempt, despite these provocations, to continue to try and build good relations <laughs> with Pakistan. Um, but uh, uh, unless there is some reciprocal gesture, as he was forced to say on his Independence Day speech on the 15th of August, where he said, you know, one can extend the hand of partnership, but on the other hand, if my citizens keep getting killed, it's very difficult, I'm paraphrasing, it's very difficult to continue this process. Um, so um, Kashmir re really remains uh, sort of the knob of the problem as far as relations with Pakistan go. Thanks, Jim. Um <laughs> Your, your talk was on foreign policy, and foreign policy uh, generally has two aspects, economic and security. Um, but in your talk, it sounded as if both the, the real independent variables and dependent variables were economic. So it's this economic crisis in 91 that really is the genesis of this shift. Um, and, the time, and the shift is a shift in domestic and foreign economic policy and opening to the market. Um, you cited other things that had to do with security, but I didn't see them actually having any causal role. So um, going with the Soviet Union, um, and, you, and then on the causal side and on the dependent variable side, you talked about uh, a grudging acceptance, maybe even partial bandwagoning with U.S. hegemony. But as, as Dean Steinberg said, I, I don't really see very much evidence of that. So my question is several part. First of all, is there any uh, 
bigger role in your story for security concerns, either on the causal aspect or on the dependent variable aspect. And then the second question is, since there seems to be so little real Indian strategic alliance with the US, that is, what does the US care about? Weapons of mass destruction and Iran. And India is thumbing its nose at the US on both of those issues. Um, yes, they do tsunami relief, but really that's not a pressing security concern for the US. So India has defied the US on the US's most important security concerns. And the question is, what should the US do about that? Should the US continue to help India's economy without exacting a quid pro quo in terms of security concerns? Um, OK. Um, uh, some things I spoke of uh, were in a very kind of telegraphic language because I was intent on not living up uh, to the popular and rather errant stereotype of being a Bengali professor who can't, you know, shut up, uh, just drones on and on. Um, uh, so I wanted to dispel that primordial uh, image uh, since I don't believe in primordial notions of ethnicity. Um, on security. I think that's a very, very legitimate question. Um, as one very senior Indian diplomat put it to me at the end of the Soviet collapse, he said, for us, it's the galactic equivalent of the disappearance of a supernova. And I said, what the devil do you mean by that? All these astronomical metaphors don't mean much to me. You know, I'm not an astrophysicist. And he said, look, we had completely relied on them. We knew. Any time we squeezed them, we could get the fox bat. Okay? We want an, the Americans won't sell us the AWACS, we'll get, you know, the Soviet AWACS from them. The Pakistanis buy something uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from France, fine. We'll get the latest Soviet submarines. So suddenly these characters are saying, we won't even sell you spare parts. And we'll sell you spare parts if you, you know, and 70% of your weaponry is of Soviet origin. And we won't even sell you spare parts unless you give us hard currency. It was a major security issue for India. And the, recognizing this, they said, you know, we can't afford to piss the United States off as we have in the past because we have no one else to turn to. Um, the French will sell us Agosta class submarines, but those will come at, you know, they'll, they'll come in hard currency. Uh, if you're going to have to buy stuff in hard currency, make up with the United States. Okay, that's one vital issue. But not only that, it's ill understood in this country the extraordinary fears, whether they are legitimate or not, we can sit here and argue till the end of the day. But the Indians are petrified of Chinese power. They've virtually been Finlandized, to use a term from another era. Certain options are not on the table as far as China is concerned. You have to appease the Chinese because they are the 800-pound gorilla in the room. And they have shown us what they can do. Over, with the Soviets gone, who's going to pin them down along the Usuri River? There's nobody there, okay? You saw almost immediately at the end of the Cold War, India starting to make overtures towards China. Oh, let's try and settle the border dispute. Let's raise it to a much higher level in terms of discussions. Um, you want us to make certain concessions, we will. Um, we have domestic constraints. But a desperate attempt. Why was Hu Jintao in Delhi last week? Because the Indians want to make nice to him. Um, but in turn, Hu Jintao went to New Delhi, to go back to Dean Steinberg's question, is because they fear an emergent, and dare I use the word, in their eyes, an American-Indian axis. They fear there's an American-Indian nexus emerging. And certain people in the Bush administration have not disabused them of that notion, saying, yeah, you know, there is this growing military power south of China, and they're nice and friendly to us. They're a democracy, um, and we're perfectly happy to work with them. Um, so China remains a very serious security concern. And for that, uh, you have to have decent relations with the United States. It's absolutely imperative. Otherwise, you would not have gotten the spate of military exercises. When American and Indian troops were training in Alaska last summer, 
I had to scratch my head. Now, for, you know, for people like Jim who've been in government, this does not seem much because there are so many cooperative ventures with military ventures with so many other countries. But you have to understand what base you were starting from with India. When you're starting from a base of zero, 30 looks good. Okay? You don't need 100. Eventually, you hope to get to 100. Um, but for the moment, 30 is awfully good. When you started actually at minus 10, not zero, more accurately. Um, so there is an important security component that's driving the shift in Indian foreign, foreign, policy, foreign policy. No question about it in my mind. Uh, Jim, I didn't answer your question about democracy promotion. Uh, here there is a uh, genuine uh, difference. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the Indians sort of uh, say, well, you know, um, we are all for uh, democratic uh, uh, regimes, um, but we don't think that democracy can be imposed from above. Um, that democracy is something that has to grow sort of organically, and while we are certainly prepared to, you know, bring in people, hold conferences, uh, uh, teach legislators sort of, you know, uh, norms of democratic conduct, uh, help people with uh, uh, conducting elections, uh, with which we have lots of experience, they'll say, uh, we're happy to do that. But in terms of actually physically prodding other countries to adopt a particular system, uh, we are a bit leery uh, about that. And this goes back to sort of the early uh, sort of the uh, part of the Cold War where you know, there's this enormous emphasis on uh, the internal affairs of states are really beyond the, our purview. Uh, that notion, uh, sort of a very Westphalian notion, oddly enough, uh, pervades Indian thinking. Um, uh, on Iran, um, I think you're a bit harsh. Um, uh, uh, the Indians actually have cooperated on Iran. Um, and contrary, uh, it's a little known fact that in the 1980s, the Iranians under Rafsanjani, um, late 80s, approached India and said, we will give you uninterrupted supplies of oil if you sell us nuclear technology. The Indians snubbed them. So there is a record of drawing a line. Iran is, the relationship with Iran is instrumental. Um, you have a large Shia community at home. You can't afford to alienate them, particularly given the fraught state of Hindu-Muslim relations in India. Two, the Iranians don't particularly like the Pakistanis. As long as they don't like the Pakistanis and it gives the Pakistanis something to worry about on their western flanks, yeah, it's worth having a relationship with Iran. And as an Indian, senior Indian diplomat, the head of the uh, uh, America's division told me, he said, yeah, we'll dilute our relationship with Iran the day you guys dilute your relationship with Saudi Arabia. It was a bit of a cocky remark, I thought. Um, India has been Japan's like, biggest recipient of foreign aid, yes. but overall, overall throughout the 90s, perhaps getting a little better today, um, <coughs> diplomatic and economic relations have been poor between the two countries. Um, I know there's been some efforts to improve it on the economic front, at least. Um, how is that relationship changing with India's new foreign policy, and is that related to India's concern about China at all? There is a great deal of unhappiness in certain quarters of India's uh, foreign policy establishment that India has done pitiably little to court the Japanese. Um, an attempt was made to mollify the Japanese after the nuclear tests because the Japanese, for understandable reasons, took an extraordinarily dim view of the Indian nuclear tests and participated in the sanctions regime. Um, uh, and at that point, there was a concerted effort to try and uh, um, assuage their sense of anger and frustration with the Indian tests. But there has been very little follow-up. Uh, there is a fairly robust economic relationship which has undergone some hiccups because there have been some labor troubles at major Japanese um, uh, plants in India. But uh, uh, with uh, the Indian automotive industry growing the f in the fashion that it is, I just read in the Financial Times the day before yesterday that Bombay adds 200 cars a day uh, to its roadways. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a nightmarish prospect, but that's another story, uh, given the state of congestion in Bombay. Um, uh, that the Japanese are, are in there to stay for a longer time. It really, uh, the, in, 
in India's focus on Southeast Asia, the United States, and to a lesser degree on Western Europe, Japan has been neglected. And uh, India is paying a price for that neglect. But I think there is an effort now underway to try and repair that relationship. Uh, first of all, let me say that um, uh, your absence on this campus is felt by those who are interested in South Asian policy. Uh, you talked about change in foreign policy in, in, in India. And one of the analysis, uh, in your analysis, you said that may, much of this was probably a response to various crises. Uh, to me, it seems like having worked in the civil service in Pakistan, uh, it comes from the same the British Indian civil service thing, that the foreign office bureaucracy would have you know, that sort of training. Because the training is you maintain the status quo unless there is a crisis, and then you ad adopt. Uh, or adapt accordingly. Uh, is there a reform process in the foreign office uh, or foreign policy decision making there? You're absolutely right. I mean, th these are two bureaucracies that were literally cut from the same cloth. Uh, you know, the same habits of mind, uh, 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 you know, uh, pervade uh, uh, the, uh, the two uh, bureaucracies. Uh, and you're quite quite uh, right that there is a great unwillingness to sort of shake things up unless you're faced with a fundamental crisis and then actually it's sort of you know political initiative that forces you against your will to do things differently i mean there's a lot of bureaucratic foot dragging that goes on um, uh, and with great reluctance you know you implement things but in a half-hearted fashion um, um, uh, 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 you, you don't uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, vigorously carry uh, things out. And uh, having worked in the civil service, you know of ways of how to temper uh, the d dictates of, uh, of, of politicians. Because uh, the sense is, and I'm sure this is true in Pakistan, that the sense is, well, you know, after the next election, these chaps are going to go. Or in the case of Pakistan, if the military dismisses them, these chaps will go. Uh, but we are going to be here anyway. And we are the bulwark of stability to this country. How many times have I heard this uh, in India? Um, uh, uh, there is a modest effort at reform right now uh, on uh, Prime Minister Singh's agenda. But how far he'll be able to carry this out, given the multiple items that he's dealing with, and with the multiple crises that he's confronting, um, both in terms of public policy and in terms of you know, the, uh, the constant juggling and chicanery that goes on in Indian politics, especially when you're running a coalition regime. Keeping members of a very fractious coalition together consumes a disproportionate amount of his time and energy. And I have it on very good authority that about three times he's threatened to resign and saying, you know, a pox on all your houses uh, because you're not really interested in the good of the country. All you're interested is in, you know, in obtaining um, some uh, uh, patronage for your particular faction or your particular party, not to mention your own pockets. Um, uh, and each time this threat has uh, managed to sort of concentrate the mind. But then you reach a point of diminishing returns. You know, how many times can you invoke that threat before somebody says, OK, yeah, we'll hold new elections? Um, but there is, to answer your question directly, there is a modest effort at reform of the bureaucracy, but it's going to be a very tall order because of path dependence. You know, there are interests that have become deeply embedded and implicated over the last 60 years. And um, changing uh, the course of this uh, super tanker is not easy. <laughs> Bringing the politics up, um, <coughs> what if Sonia Gandhi had decided to be prime minister? Where would we be today? Um, and, and also, I guess what that says is if we have elections, where are we likely to go? Had Sonia Gandhi been prime minister, I suspect we would have probably had two more coalition governments. Because what the BJP would have done, the Bharatiya Janata Party, this right wing um, Hindu nationalist party, um, uh, they would have simply resorted to the worst. It's hard to imagine how much lower they could sink, but I'm sure they'd find a way. 
um, to trawl through the trenches. Uh, 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 they would find a way to generate the ugliest form of populist and jingoistic nationalism uh, and say, you know, now we are being ruled by Rome. Um, you know, she will take orders from the Pope um, uh, and that we are becoming a Christian nation. And they would stir up enough trouble that at some point the government would just collapse because somebody would withdraw uh, support. And they would also try and dredge up um, something, unfortunately, she does have a skeleton in her closet, thanks to her husband, the famous Bofors case, where India bought these Swedish field guns. Uh, and it's quite clear money changed hands uh, in the choice of uh, the particular artillery that, that was purchased. And that was under her husband's watch. And they would resurrect that um, particular ghost and make it stalk the land. Um, were elections to be held tomorrow? After the last elections, when even my friends uh, who do serious quantitative sampling were completely found out to lunch, I've stopped making predictions. Um, uh, these are people who do very good, serious survey research. Um, uh, they just completely blew it. Um, not one of them called the elections uh, correctly. And I think I have a partial answer. Uh, and it's largely because they relied heavily um, uh, on urban samples. Uh, they didn't use sufficiently large samples that captured. So it was a problem of what's called construct validity. Am I really measuring what I'm purporting to measure? Uh, um, and um, uh, the, the, but to answer, try and hazard a guess, uh, my suspicion is you would again get a coalition. Congress would lose a certain amount because of anti-incumbency. Uh, in other areas, they would continue to do well. Uh, they would get the minority vote because they have actually managed uh, to maintain a degree of social peace. Um, um, and the BJP is finding it very hard going now because I think they reached the logical limit of their anti-Muslim zealotry, um, not uh, in terms of their beliefs but in terms of the instrumental value thereof. And I think they overplayed their hand in Gujarat, where there was a pogrom uh, in February 2004 or 2003. 2003, I think, yes. Um, while elements of the BJP supporters might not like Muslims, they were horrified by what took place in Gujarat because this was India's first real pogrom, where the state became actively implicated in the massacre of a portion of the country's population purely on the basis of their religious affiliation. That has given some people pause. Yeah, you know, I'm not particularly enamored of Muslims, but I don't want to see mass slaughter in the streets uh, and, you know, dis an order completely evaporate. Um, and that, in many ways, I think uh, some polls reveal that that had an effect on the elections. And so um, the BJP is not going to do especially well uh, because they haven't been able to find a single issue by which they can tar and feather the Congress. That's a bit of a long-winded answer. Very good. Sure, let me ask you a very specific policy question, which is, should the United States support India's uh, joining the Security Council as a permanent member? given the new cooperation and all of that? No, it should wait. Uh, it should wait. Because India has to prove its bona fides a bit more to the United States. Um, uh, that uh, uh, if I was an American policymaker, I would recommend waiting. Um, and would you set specific criteria that, that the U.S. should set out for the Indian government that would... would you know, a test or whatever criteria that, that the United States would, would judge, what would be, and what would that be? Um, I wouldn't do it publicly because that's the quickest way of ensuring that that's the end of it. Uh, you know, it would generate the most um, vicious nationalist backlash in India, uh, even amongst people who are not given to, you know, strong jingoistic sentiments. Uh, it, it would have that effect. Um, I would uh, set, for example, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult for this particular administration to do it, but something I'm passionate about, uh, um, certain targets on global warming. Uh, 
that India come on board on, in terms of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, on, uh, on trade, uh, you know, India can't have it both ways. Oh, oh, on occasion we are an advanced industrial country because we want our pharmaceutical patents to be protected because now we are really investing in R&D and we don't want, you know, some pesky third world country uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, peddling uh, the same uh, products by just manufacturing it slightly differently. Um, Bollywood is now becoming, becoming ubiquitous, so we are very concerned about piracy, intellectual piracy and intellectual property. But then the next day turn around and say, oh, we are a helpless developing country and we can't make any concessions on agriculture. Um, quiet, firm statements, okay, what are you prepared to do for us in these areas? Um, we need some targets, we need some dates, we need some specific commitments from you. We're not, we're not going to advertise this, we're not going to, you know, have a drumbeat about this. Um, uh, we won't announce it in a joint communique, but we can have quiet discussions about these things, and we need absolute, you know, firm commitments from you. Um, uh, and I think these are the kinds of things that we would ask for, or we should ask for. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. I just want to, you spoke about the shadow of the past and how it's going to affect the future of U.S. Indian relations. Let me sort of turn it around on you and ask you about the shadow of the past and how it's going to affect uh, Delhi's relations with Moscow. Is, is there any way for the Russians to get back into the game, particularly now that uh, it's no longer like the early 1990s when they were flat on their back, the oil prices are up, uh, they are uh, feeling their oats, and uh, <coughs> presumably there are elements in Indian society for whatever reason uh, may have fond memories of cooperation with Moscow. Uh, can we expect that, and could a strategically inclined Indian government use initiatives or overtures to Moscow to play off both Beijing and Washington? No. Um, because Moscow is still perceived to be too anemic. Um, uh, it's perceived to be too febrile. Um, their institutions are um, not robust. It's woven around the personality of Vladimir Putin. Um, uh, um, uh, other than its sudden surge of oil wealth, there are, this was already happening. There were structural asymmetries emerging by the uh, early 1980s that the Moscow could not supply India with certain kinds of technology which India desperately wanted. Um, I remember Robert Donaldson, who was a Soviet specialist, writing about this for the first time, saying there are strains emerging in, in that alliance because India is increasingly wanting things to deepen its industrial growth which cannot be obtained from Moscow. The United States and the West really remain India's best hope, and this is not my normative preference. I'm simply expressing a strategic reality. So to flip it around from Washington's perspective, yes. there's no one else for India to dance with? Uh, bluntly put, yes. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, even the, the French can't uh, do it. I mean, the French have far too many domestic problems. Uh, in certain sectors, yes. But, you know, as... Uh, Someone told me in the Indian Foreign Ministry, look, whether we like it or not, the Americans are indispensable. Uh, I see the American relationship as an indispensable relationship. I would have never heard this word in South Bloc, which is the Ministry of External Affairs, 10 years ago. I mean, I, I had to sort of literally pinch myself. Um, and then there is an interesting coalition emerging, since I know... the the policy-making world intimately in India, there's an interesting coalition emerging. There's a coalition emerging um, in a billion people composed of about 50, uh, but it's the, this, this attentive public that makes vital decisions about foreign policy, who feel that the American relationship is essential for transforming India domestically. If India is to surge ahead, the only way to do it is with the American relationship. That you will pry open certain sectors of the Indian economy by saying, look, if we don't do it, the Americans will go away. You want to bring about certain kinds of domestic reforms. You lack the coalition at home. 
So what do you do? You put the onus elsewhere and say, unless we do this, we won't get certain things. So let's create a conducive atmosphere so we get some of the other things that we want. It's a kind of a two-level game. Isn't there another element, and that is that there's a couple million Indians uh, living in the U.S., uh, at generally upper, upper middle class, and virtually every elite in India has three or four relatives living here, and uh, more or less see themselves as kind of part of binational families? The diaspora is increasingly making an important contribution. Uh, the latest figures, uh, census figures suggest they are the uh, wealthiest um, immigrant group currently in the United States. Uh, and it's largely because of the patterns of immigration. People with already middle class skills uh, or middle class professions who migrated uh, to this country and the next generation um, has benefited from American education dramatically. Um, um, and they are playing an increasing role. And in fact, uh, um, um, Bob, Jairam Ramesh is the Minister of Com No, not Commerce. What's his exact position now in the government? Commerce, commerce Minister of Commerce. Yeah, the Minister of, uh, Minister of Commerce, who's a near MIT PhD, he never quite finished his dissertation, um, a Myron Wiener student, no less, um, uh, wrote a wonderful essay for the Asia Society uh, called Yankee Go Home and Take Me With You, uh, which captured the sentiments of a lot of Indians prior to the, cold, uh, prior to the end of the Cold War. But today, it's, it's, there's not even the Yankee Go Home part. It's just Take Me With You. Uh, the first part has been just dropped um, for these Indian elites. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the, ane the anecdotal evidence certainly suggests that, I mean, every person I talk to on a research trip to India will say, oh, do you know so-and-so at the University of Oklahoma? Um, as if, you know, it's just next door. Or even if it were, um, you know, my uh, brother teaches political science at the University of Oklahoma. I mean, it, it, the, the extraordinary range of contacts that have developed and uh, the formation of this kind of binational, in fact, it's even now being institutionalized. India is opening up um, uh, dual citizenship. It's finally passed parliament. Uh, it's restricted to certain countries, uh, the United States being the principal one, um, but it's, um, it's available now. Okay, well, this has been terrific. Let me ask you all to join me and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.